in 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Have nothing to do with godless myths or old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Heavenly Father, as we open up your word today to hear from you, Lord, would you give me the communication to speak clearly what you have for their hearts? And Lord, open up all of our hearts to receive your message that you've prepared for me to prepare for them. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done and all that you're doing in this church. For it's in Jesus' name, amen. Do you have things in your life that you know that you have to do, but you don't want to do them? you have things like that in your life? I do. I'll tell you one of the things that I hate to do, but it has to be done, and that's the dishes. I absolutely, and you can ask Chloe, I absolutely hate doing the dishes. There's something, like, I don't mind necessarily to get my hands dirty, just not in dirty dishes. There is something when water touches old grimy food that just absolute disgusts me in the deepest part of my soul to where I don't like to do it. Now, I don't even like to put up the clean dishes either. Like all of that, that's just laziness. Like there's nothing wrong with clean dishes. That's just laziness. But I hate doing the dishes. And, and growing up, I hated doing the dishes then too. You can ask mom. Growing up, I hated doing the dishes. And we had two dishwashers in the house. It was me and Jessica. But we hated doing the dishes. Both of us did. And we would take turns on who would get to skip out this week doing the dishes. But there's something else that, that I hate to do. And that's fold and put up the laundry. Now, I have to be extra specific with this because I actually kind of enjoy putting the, the dirty laundry into the washer, taking it out of the washer and putting it into the dryer, taking it out of the dryer and bringing it upstairs. But once I see it in the basket, I don't know if it's just like the scavenger hunt part of me that I enjoy to just dig through it instead of fold it and put it away, but that's what I do. And so I, I, I will eventually put it up. But I love to just look through the basket. And so I do, I, I'm, I'm very focused. Like whenever I see the laundry basket in our room start to get full. I'm like, it needs to get washed. So I put it in the washer. About an hour and a half later, I'll say, okay, I think I heard it go off. So I go back down, I put it in the dryer. And then when I hear it go off, I want to put it back upstairs. But then once it gets there, I, the laziness sets in. And I'm like, I just want to hunt for my clothes. Like, I don't, I don't want them to be all nicely put away. I like to hunt for them. So uh, it annoys Chloe to death, both of those things, that I do that. But I hate doing that part. But you know what I love? I love eating food on clean dishes. And I love clean laundry to wear. In fact, I'm a little weird about my clean laundry, but that's a whole different sermon, a whole different topic. What I want to focus on is I love wearing clean clothes. I don't like to reuse my clothes too much. And so I, I also love for my wife to be happy with me. And I love to spoil her as much as I can. And if I want Chloe to be happy, one of the ways, this isn't the only way, but one of the ways that I can do that is to put in the work, to do the dishes, and to fold and put away the laundry. And then I also get the benefit of clean dishes and clean laundry and a little bit of satisfaction that I did that. I put in the work, I accomplished it, it's there. But here's the problem. If I don't do the dishes or the laundry, it still gets done because guess who does it? Chloe, which means that I can sit all day long and watch her do it and still enjoy the benefits of clean dishes and clean laundry. And I think that's how we can be with God sometimes and in a church culture because surely God will send someone to do the work for us. 
so that we can sit and watch and reap the harvest of the benefits of what they've done. And if we get too comfortable in this space of sitting and watching, we'll miss out on the actual benefits, the satisfaction and the growth that we'll have spiritually. And we'll miss out on who we're supposed to be in Christ. And that's where our devotion to God comes in. Because to increase our devotion to God, we also have to stay disciplined to walk with the Spirit and to walk in the Spirit, which means that we have to train to be holy. We have to train to be godly. Now, before we get too deep into this, I'm going to tell you something that's a little bit of a disclaimer, and none of you are going to like it. Most of you won't like it. Training takes time. I know. I, I just like you, want it to show up tomorrow. I want to do like all the steps. I want to make a list, do all the things, and then I'm a perfect, sinless Christian. Right? I wish all of us could be like that world would be a whole lot of a better place. But training takes time. Staying disciplined takes time, especially before you see results. Now, since Paul uses this illustration of physical training and matches it with spiritual training, I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, an illustration using the same things. When it comes to weight loss programs or exercising to gain muscle or just to simply be fit, most things will, most people will tell you that it takes about four to six weeks for a noticeable difference, uh, a noticeable change in your weight, in your size, um, in your muscle tone, whatever it is. After that point, your weight loss and your muscle gain will start to slow down a little bit. You, you won't lose as much weight as you did in the first four to six weeks, in the following four to six weeks, typically. Exercising to gain muscle, typically, if you are consistent with it, for a year, you'll experience the largest amount of muscle growth that you'll ever have in your entire life, unless you stop and then you, you restart after a long time. But that's basic. Uh, it's not like scientific, so don't like completely quote me on it, but that's what I've been taught. Now, in a quick Google search, and this was a very quick Google search that I did this week, you'll find that around 65 to 70% of dieters gain back at least 80% of their weight within three years. Why do you think that is? Well, lots of reasons, but I think what the majority of it boils down to is that they didn't stay consistent and they didn't stay disciplined in what they were doing. So when you start, everything happens fairly fast. After you do it for a while, it slows down or you start to maintain. You, you hit plateaus, you hit walls, you hit ceilings, whatever it is. And you start to plateau and... Things slow down, life settles in, inconsistency settles into your life, and eventually you fall back into old habits. In a very similar way, our consistency, consistency to our spiritual discipline can fluctuate. And when it fluctuates, it causes ungodly things to be able to come in. So that's where I think Paul urges Timothy so much to train to be godly to be godly in all that you do. And what I hope uh, through this message is to give you some tools to help you train for godliness, to help you at least start your, your training program per se. But first things first, you have to have a good foundation. And so we have to put our hope in Christ. We have to have a solid foundation on biblical understanding, good theology. We have to have a good foundation on who God is, what he's done, and what he's doing. A couple chapters later in 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verses 11 and 12, it says, But you, still talking to Timothy, Paul to Timothy, but you, man of God, flee from all of this. And when he says all of this, what he talked about in the verses before was all of the unrighteousness, all of the ungodly things. It says, Flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Verse 12, probably the more famous one, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called to make your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. What I think Paul is saying here, part of what he's saying is there's a fight to stay holy. There's a fight to stay godly. You have to train and continue to train for godliness because everything in this world is going to try to pull you away. It's going to try to pull you away from godliness. 
And that's why we call it a, a fight for our faith. Because we, we all know where we want to be, where we have an idea of what type of faith we want to have, because we have people that are ahead of us that have a much stronger faith, and we're like, I want to have faith like that person. And so we reach for those things, but the world is constantly pulling us away from those things. And so it's a fight, it's a struggle to continue to achieve. Just like with any exercise program, it's a hard thing to stay consistent. It's hard to stay consistent. It's hard to stay consistent exercising. It's hard to stay consistent uh, eating healthy foods. When, let's be honest, there's probably family members and friends that don't eat healthy. And so when you see the things that you used to love and you're like, oh, I can't eat that now. It's a fight to not just say, oh, just one, one little bite's not going to hurt me. One little, one little slice of pie is not going to hurt me, right? So... We have to pursue righteousness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness in the same way. That yes, that, that some of this sin and some of, this thing, some of these things that are pulling us away from God, all of our friends might be doing it, some of our family members might be dragging us in, and we got to fight to stay focused on who we're serving. And so how do you do that? How, how do you continue to fight? Well, I think the Bible gives so many examples of this, but I want to take you to Galatians chapter 5, starting verse 16. The really famous passage. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Now, if I stopped at verse 16, that's all you need to know. You walk by the Spirit, that's how you fight. You walk with the Spirit, you walk with God, and if you continue to walk with God, you won't have the desires for the, the ungodly things in the world anymore. But let me explain where we are. Verse 17. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not so that you are not to do whatever you want. Meaning there are things because we're human, because we are imperfect. Because we are sinful. We desire sin, but we have to stay focused on God. And this is the fight. It's an internal fight that all of us have. We desire what we want, but we don't always get what we want, and we don't always need what we want because God knows what's best for us. And so uh, we'll continue on. Verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, and orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before, those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so these are all of our desires put into just very basic categories that can span into any level of sin. We desire these things, but we have to separate ourselves from our desires and pursue what comes next, the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, it says forbearance and NIV, but I like patience better. So patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Jesus... To Christ Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And so how we fight for holiness, how we fight for godliness, is being aware of where God is. Because if you're not aware of where God is, you're like a little kid who's lost in Walmart, and you don't know where your parents at. You're panicked, you're frustrated, or you're distracted by toys. Or candy. Things that you don't necessarily need, but you want. And so we have to be constantly aware of where God is, what blessings he's giving us, what he's doing, and we're walking in the spirit. We're following him. We're saying, God, whatever you want, this is what I want. This is, I may not actually want what you want, but I, I want to walk with where you're walking because you know where you're going. And so, for instance, if you start exercising, and you don't know what, you're, what to do. 
you've never started exercising before, it's been a long time, you forgot everything about fitness and all that stuff, and you walk into a gym and you don't know what to do, you'll never actually exercise, or at least you won't exercise correctly with good form. Chances are that you'll probably walk in, you might do a few things, and then you'll leave and you'll be like, I, I guess I, I did it. I exercised. But you're probably not going to come back consistently because you don't have a guideline for what you need to do. If you don't have the discipline to stay consistent in your training, you will see little to no results. Because a couple, a couple bicep curls here, a couple lunges here, maybe a few jumping jacks here, it's not sustainable for you if it's just ever so often. If you don't have any goals, you won't have the motivation to push yourself. You won't know where you're even going. You won't even know what you're trying to achieve. And so you won't be able to track your improvement and your strength and your weight loss and whatever your goal is. You won't be able to see those improvements because you don't have a place. You don't have a destination. It's the same thing with spiritual training. You won't know what to do unless you pick up the word of God. And so the word of God is like our workout plan. You open it up. The Bible has so many stories and it's filled with wisdom so that you know what you need to do to grow stronger. All you got to do is open up your Bible and start reading. And you'll find characters, you'll find people who lived in history that their story was, uh, was recorded in the Bible and you can, you can relate to people in the Bible and say, man, in this area of my life, I'm a lot like Peter. I'm not even listening to what God's saying. I'm just doing it what I think is best. Or you'll relate to other people in the Bible. And so you won't actually know what to do unless you start opening God's word and getting good biblical foundation. Next is devoting your time to God is the discipline you need to stay consistent. If you're not de constantly devoting yourself to God every single day and, and being in the word of God, knowing what you're supposed to do and just walking in step with him, being with him, spending time with him, if you don't do any of those things, you're going to see little to no results in your faith growing and you're going to stay where you've always been. And if you never reflect on where you are and set goals for your faith, you will never be motivated to fight for your faith. Because you'll be in a place and Satan will even convince you, you're fine. Your faith is great. You're perfect. Just keep doing what you're doing. What the devotion to God is meant to do is to push you to see where you're falling short so that you can get better. Don't stay where you fall short. Don't stay there and say, well, you know, I'm just, I'm horrible at this. And so I'm just going to stay here because everything that I've done, it's not good enough. So I'm just, you know, I'll never be good enough. So I'm just going to stay right here and not move on. No, this, this whole series and, and this, uh, this sermon is meant to help you see that, yes, we do fall short but you can always improve and get better so that a year from now you can look back and say, I'm more loving than I was. I'm more um, aware of where God is in my life than I was a year ago. This is what it's meant to do. So I wrote out uh, a little quick 10-minute spiritual workout plan to, to help you, right? If you're just now starting out, 10-minute spiritual workout plan. Take 10 minutes a day. Now, if this was an exercise plan, I'd tell you to take a rest day, but, you know, Satan's after you every day. So you need to be aware every single day of where God is. And so, 10 minutes. First, before you can even sit down and go through this 10-minute exercise, you have to set a goal for yourself. Now, how do you do this? Well, some of you probably know of someone, whether they're living or they passed away, who had a faith that you desired to be like. Like, I desire to have the faith that this person has. It can even be a biblical character. Like, I honest to goodness desire to have the faith like Paul in the Bible. And so you look at that, and you, 
You know how they live their life. You know how they handle situations. If you're looking in the Bible, that's a great place to start. Start reading their stories and figure out how they navigated their faith walk. Say, I want to have faith like this person. You set a goal. Then you sit down. You open up your Bible. This is for the first five minutes of your 10-minute exercise. I want you to open up a story uh, if, of that person that you want to you wanna be like or just open up in an area of your life. Maybe it's finances. You're like, I want to trust God with more with my finances or I want to trust God more in my work. Find stories in the Bible. Find places in the Bible where it talks about money, where it talks about work, where it talks about whatever situation you're going through. I want to trust him through this chaotic situation that I'm in. Look for chaotic situations in the Bible and see how God's people handled it. And so for the five minutes, read a paragraph, read a verse, read a phrase. Try not to do the whole chapter. That'll be too much. Just start with a a paragraph, a phrase, or a verse. And repeat it over and over. There's a thing in exercising. It's called repetitions. If you do something once, it's not going to do anything for you. You have to continue to repeat the process. You have to continue to do it. If I pick up a dumbbell and I do one bicep curls, I will not get any bigger, any stronger. I have to continue to do these repetitions. And so repeat the verse, repeat the phrase, repeat the paragraph over and over again for five minutes. Ask the Holy Spirit questions. Why did, why did the translators choose this word? Why is this what the Bible says when it says this word or phrase? Repeat it over and over. And for the next five minutes, after you've taken five minutes, you can set a timer, pace yourself. Once you've done that for five minutes, take another five minutes and open up Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. And look at the fruit of the Spirit and see where you fall. So, Galatians chapter 5, 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Ask yourself, this is how you reflect. Am I always loving in all situations? Probably not, right? I, I'm assuming that, that we're not, can't say every single situation in my life, I am always filled with love. When I don't put the laundry away, I know Chloe is full of love in that moment, right? So, so you look at that, and if you fall short, if you're not loving in every single situation all the time, you need to work on love. Maybe it's, it's joy. How many of you are filled with joy all the time? <laughs> that Chloe raised her hand. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> right so unless you're filled with joy all the time you got to work on joy same thing with peace are you always peaceful just a peaceful presence wherever you go probably not it is not peaceful in our house when i haven't put up the laundry right okay i'm gonna keep i'll stop anyways so you just go through all of them Are you always patient? Probably not. I need to work on patience. I need to work on kindness. I need to work on goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I need to work on these things. And so you can very easily, and this is my warning to you, you can very easily start doing this, having God reveal to you where you're not, where you're falling short in your love, where you're falling short in your patience, where you're falling short in the areas that you thought were really good. And when he reveals to you your broken pieces in that, it is very easy and Satan will come in and he will try to tell you, stay there. You can't get to where you want to be. You are loving. You don't have to be super loving. You just got to be loving. You don't have to be super patient. You just got to be a little patient. And so you can easily get convinced. All of us can get easily convinced that we're okay. What these five minutes, the last five minutes of your 10-minute workout plan is meant to do is to see where you fall short. Not only so that 
in a year from now, you can look back and see where you've grown in your love, you've grown in your patience, you've grown in your peace. But also to see that you fall short of the glory of God. Because the goal is not perfection. Some of you in here, the way that you're wired, the way that your brain works, make a list and, and you're like, okay, I got to work on love. You will never check off that list to move on to peace, to move on to patience. You will never check off that list. And that will leave you frustrated if perfection is your goal. If perfection is the goal. The goal is to be closer to God today than you were yesterday. The goal is to be closer to God today than you were a year ago. See, the goal is not perfection. The goal is to devote yourself to God more and more each and every day and challenge yourself to grow in your faith and your love for God and for people. If you don't take this time to reflect on yourself to see where you fall short, your house and your life will be left with a bunch of dirty dishes and dirty laundry. The thing about dishes and laundry, and I've heard Chloe say this multiple times, I say it more in my mind, but it always has to happen. You wash clothes, there's always something else that's dirty. Whether you forgot to put it in there, we haven't experienced this, but maybe your kids forgot to put something in the laundry that you told them to a hundred times and they didn't. There's always dishes to be done. And if you fall behind, it can get overwhelming, right? When the dishes start piling up in the sink, I have no issue with this. I like to play Jenga and just see how high I can tack it or it can stack it up. But when the laundry baskets start to overflow, that's where I get, I, I start getting a little nervous, getting a little anxious. But if you leave these things unchecked, they will begin to pile on. Laundry baskets will overflow with dirty clothes. Sinks in your life, in your house, in your soul will fill up. All of this sin, all, all this ungodliness will continue to fill up and it will make your house filthy. It will make your life filthy. But that's where the gospel message steps in. That's where Jesus steps in because it was your lack of love and joy and your peace and patience and kindness and all the fruit of the Spirit it's because of your lack that you loved all of the things of the flesh. You desired the things of the flesh. It's because we allowed all of that filth to come in and fill our house that the dirty dishes, the dirty laundry of our soul is piling on. So much that when Jesus knocked on your door and said, hey, am I welcome into your house? Am I welcome into your life? Am I welcome into your heart? Is what we sometimes say. We say, wait a minute, let me clean up some stuff and then you can come in. Let me make myself clean and then you can come in. Listen, you will never get clean. You will never clean enough to where Jesus won't notice. But the thing about Jesus is he doesn't care because he loves you. Sometimes we treat Jesus in different places in our life and we, we invite him into some areas of our house. We, we allow him in, into the living room because the living room's always tidy. Living room looks good. And so we welcome him in and we're like, you know, you can stay in this room. Just don't go in the kitchen. Don't go in the, in the bedrooms. Don't just stay here. Just like knocking on the other doors to the bedrooms and to the kitchen. He's like, I, I want to go in here. No, 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 you can't. You can't just, just stay in here. And we treat him like a mother-in-law trying to see how, how dirty your house is, right? We don't want him in there. We're, we're like, we got to clean up. We got to hurry up and clean everything up. And I got to make myself right before Jesus can step in. But that's the opposite of the gospel message. Jesus comes into our house and says, don't worry about the dishes. Don't worry about the laundry. I got it. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to clean it up. And so Jesus walked into our life and he says, I'll clean this for you. I know you're, you're way behind. But I'm going to help you clean these. I'm going to clean these for you. Just let me in. Just let me show you that I'm the way. Let me show you that I'm the truth. Let me show you that I'm the life and the light and I'll die in your place. 
so that you can walk free from your sins. And when you accepted that and you were baptized, what he did was he took the dirty rags of your sin and he made them clean again. He made them new again. And as our dirty rags continue to pile up, Jesus keeps knocking on doors in our life and he's saying, just let me in and clean them. Just let me in and take care of this for you. Just spend time with me. Spend time in the word of God. Spend time and I will make you new again. See, a lot of devoting yourself to God is responding when he knocks on doors in your house. It's responding when he knocks on doors into your life and into your soul that you've been hiding from him, whether you knew it or not. And so what areas of your life are you closing off to God? Maybe it's out of shame or fear. Maybe it's out of ignorance that you're not, you don't even know that you're not letting them in there yet. Or maybe a better question, what sin staying close are you trying to hide from him under the couch, under the table? What, what are you trying to hide from him in the open, in the area of your life that you're like, oh, this is clean. He looks under the bed. That's what my mom would do. She'd look under the bed and there'd be all my clothes. And we see all the, all the dirt and he's like, what? Let me clean this for you. Well, well God, I just I put it under the bed so I wouldn't be embarrassed. I wouldn't be filled with fear of what you might do and what you might think, that you might think that I'm not good enough. He goes, I I know you're not good enough, but I made you good enough. I made you righteous. Just let me in and take care of it. Let me come in and and clean. And you got to do this daily. You have to lean on God daily. Because it's in in, in Galatians. Yeah, that's right. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Which I think also means he cannot be tricked. He knows you got dirty dishes. He knows you got dirty laundry in your life. He knows you have sin. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh, they will reap destruction. If you keep desiring and you keep hiding all of these dirty things in your life, if you keep pursuing the fleshly desires, From the flesh you will reap destruction, but whoever sows to please the Spirit, whoever trains themselves to be godly and to be holy, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary for doing good. Don't be weary for the discipline it takes to stay holy and to stay with God, to stay consistent, spending time with God. Don't be weary in doing good, for at a proper time, We will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, we have an opportunity. Let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. And so what I want to ask you today is will you devote your time, start devoting your time to God today? Will you train yourself to be faithful to him today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for this time, and we're grateful for the opportunity to come before you and know that you are good, and despite all of our filth, you came in, you want to clean us up. You want to make us righteous. You want to make us like you. But Lord, we also have to understand that we have to to put away our desires that, that when we came into a relationship with you, we crucified our fleshly desires with you. And so, Lord, help us to pursue holiness. Help us to pursue a, a, a devotion and discipline to stay devoted to you in all situations, in all moments of our life, so that we can continue to turn away from our fleshly desires and turn towards you who are holy, you are worthy of all of our praise. Lord, you've done so much for us so that we could come before you on Judgment Day clean. Lord, reveal to us where we've fallen short so that we can become more devoted to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.